Welcome back. It's your Feel Good Breakfast Show. We're live, large and in charge on this Tuesday morning. Medical Tuesday it is. That's why the good Dr. Darren Green joins us to talk about our topic today, which is all about the liver, the largest Indeed. bodily or internal organ in the human body that is responsible for uh, breaking down fats and alcohol. It performs very, very important functions. Um, and the question we're asking today is that could you be damaging it without even realizing it? You can give us a call on 21 to ask your questions uh, from the good doctor. Great to have you here once again, sir. Thank you. We love having you here. Let us just contextualize for a young second. Yeah. What exactly is the role of the liver? Yeah, it's got multiple roles, but uh, it's generally a factory, so it manufactures things. It's a, big factory. it's a big factory. It's situated on the right side of your of your abdomen, just under the rib cage, mm. um, over there. And uh, it's as, as you said, it's the largest internal bodily organ. Yeah. So it's a factory that manufactures different parts of your your nutritional pathways, including obviously the storage of glucose as glycogen, it's involved with fat metabolism. Mm -hmm. It's also involved with getting rid of toxins, the detox function, where it breaks down, uh, obviously, the, the components, like ammonia that you get in Handy Andy, for example, yeah. mm -hmm. cleaning agents. Yes. Uh, the liver breaks down ammonia into urea that can be secreted in the urine. It's also important in making clotting factors. Your blood wouldn't be able to clot mm -hmm. because the clotting factors and the proteins contained in these clotting factors are all manufactured in the liver. In the liver. Uh, sure. Vitamins, for example, vitamins A, vitamins D, vitamins uh, K and mm. B are all essentially obviously metabolized and, and also stored in yeah. the liver. So your ability to store a certain amount of vitamins is also dependent on your liver function. And then obviously with that comes the digestive process of manufacturing bile, the green juice or the enzymes contained in that juice that help you break down certain foodstuffs from yeah. the gallbladder. So very important organ, mm. as you can imagine. One might say the hardest <coughs> working organ in the, other than the skin, it re protecting does it your rest? insides. When it, does it rest? It yeah. never does. Yeah. Wow. So <coughs> what exactly does a healthy liver look like and how do you keep it that way? 100%. So the liver comprises specialized cells called hepatocytes and a healthy liver has good blood supply to it. It also has hepatocytes that are obviously function, functioning optimally where the mechanisms of removing the byproducts so on are removed. That's a healthy liver, a nice deep red in color. Mm -hmm. And what we see on this side is what's called a fatty liver. Covered sure. in fat. Yes, so your liver can be fat uh, as well. And the infiltration of fat cells in between the normal liver cells is something that we're going to get into because the different causes and preventable things that one can do. But people don't know that some of the lifestyle choices we make lead to that fatty liver disease. And then that can lead to dire consequences of pain uh, and, a, and a, an array of systemic manifestations. Sure. So I'm sure that, you know, problems with your liver, it's not maybe easily identifiable, but like what are the things that I should be noticing if I'm worried that something's wrong with my liver? That's just it. So initially, uh, with mild inflammation of the liver or hepatitis, you have no symptoms. Yeah. The only way of picking up, picking it up is on a blood test mm. that shows mildly elevated liver enzymes. When it progresses to moderate hepatitis or inflammation of the liver, that's when you start the symptoms. And they ah. are typically things like nausea, absolute, uh, you know, you, you really, bilious, you want to, to vomit constantly. You have pain, like that gentleman has over there. Mm. You could also be tired and suffer from fatigue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, your urine can become extremely dark. Your, your stools can become very light, for example, as well, sure. due to the metabolic pathways and the breakdown of certain proteins. All right, well, we've got a caller on the line, our first of the morning. Good morning to you, Lindy Way from Benoni. Yes, sir, how are you? I'm very well. I haven't been called sir in a long time. I feel very privileged. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> What's your question or comment? My question is, uh, what are the chances of a person who's taking an ARV um, if we take them on an empty stomach? Uh, what are the chances of damaging the liver? Because mm. usually, if I take them on an, on, after uh, eating, mm -hmm. it's kind of feeling wet, feeling wet at my stomach. So mm. I prefer to take them on an empty stomach. All right, great question. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Lindy. So uh, what do you say to that? Doctor? Yes, so there'll be very clear instructions with different medications. She's speak, speaking specifically about ARVs, and some of them certainly do have an effect on on the liver and some people, that's why we check the liver enzymes, the blood test, before we start someone on medication to see if it's causing inflammation, uh, you know, due to hepatitis. Mm -hmm. That's drug induced. There are lots of medications that can cause toxicity to the liver mm -hmm. and we don't, you can't predict that until someone's actually 
started taking them. Yeah. Um, of, often in the genetic history, you can also get that information by asking about certain medications. But what she mentions is quite interesting. Some medications need to be taken on an empty stomach. That's got to do with how the medication is metabolized and at what pH it needs to be broken down mm -hmm. into mm. its subcomponents and then absorbed. So when the liver's involved, anything, whether it's food or medication, it gets acted upon by the acid in the stomach, it breaks it down, all right, that gets absorbed into the bloodstream, and the bloodstream then transports whatever substance, including alcohol, all the way to the liver. Yeah. And then when the blood arrives at the liver, the liver filters out that blood yeah. and then deals with the different components in mm -hmm. different ways. She, f she says that she prefers taking it on an empty stomach. Yes. Could be that the other enzymes that are busy digesting are also involved at the same time and that the mechanisms involved in absorbing the drug might be affected by food, which can happen in certain types of breakdown. Yeah. But to answer her question, could she potentially be damaging her liver by taking it before eating? No, so she can take it, if she feels that she doesn't have nausea or side effects, with specifically with the type of medication she mentioned, yes. no problems. All right, thank yeah. you so much, Lindy Weir, for that. And we're going to keep our lines open. 021-430-9881. We're talking all about the liver, the hardest working organ in the human body. It's my feel-good worth the show. In keeping with all matters of health, we are back again with Dr. Darren Green and our lines are open on 021-4309-881. We're talking all about liver health, how to keep it healthy, especially it, because it is the hardest working organ in your body that is responsible for so many functions, including one that we probably uh, subjected to more often than, than we should, uh, <laughs> alcohol breakdown. Especially come Thursdays. Hey, hey <laughs> alcohol <laughs> breakdown. So w when it comes to mm. our liver, when does it become detrimental to our health? Yes. Um, uh, to, to consume uh, alcohol, at, at, at least to our liver's health. So people need to know a little bit about alcohol. So alcohol, when it's ingested, it goes to the stomach. It gets absorbed in the stomach and the mm. intestines into the bloodstream. And the highest concentration of alcohol then returns via the blood to the liver. The liver then receives the blood. And now what it's got to do is actually certain enzymes that it contains uh, has to then break it down into components that can be broken down into water and carbon dioxide eventually. So the long of the short is those enzymes, you only have a certain amount available yeah. for the amount of incoming blood with alcohol and the enzymes are being used to break it down, break it down. So mm -hmm. you can imagine that you exhaust your mechanism of breaking yeah. down alcohol and then you have the effect of it's building up, it's building up without being broken down yeah. and that causes then inflammation in the liver uh, and a whole lot of other complaints. I mean, one of them are things like fatty liver disease, yeah. the fat that we saw, uh, uh, alcohol causes that. There we go. And the fatty liver disease, the hepatitis, which is mm. the inflammation and the pain and the sensitivity with the nausea, etc. And then the third thing, obviously, is the irreversible scarring damage. Mm. So when those mechanisms are exhausted, you don't have enzymes, a young, a young liver has the ability to bounce back. Heavy drinkers, for example, survive sometimes up to 10 years before they start having irreversible damage and scarring in the liver. Hmm. Wow. And uh, so like a gecko's tail that gets cut off or breaks off, can regrow, your liver can regenerate tissue mm. with its amazing cells. But the ability to do that is lost yeah. with time. And that's what happens. People think they can have the same binging episodes, bounce back mm. the yeah. next day. So the scar tissue is what then permanently damages the liver and wipes out a certain percentage of its function over time. Okay. So you lose 10%, 20%, 30%. And then you'll start with all the systemic signs of that. So uh, ideally just stop drinking kind of thing? Is that what we're saying? We're saying that you need to be aware of how much you're drinking yeah, firstly. Yeah. So your body has the ability to deal with one unit of alcohol yeah. per hour. Okay. And to, for those that don't know, one unit is like 76 mils of wine. 76 mils of wine is like a quarter cup. Oh, wow. So two <laughs> un that's one unit <laughs> per hour. Your body does that People without any damage to the bottle. liver. <laughs> wow. So without damage to the liver, one unit per hour. Two units, obviously, is 150 mils. That's yeah. like a half a cup of wine. <gasps> so so even must as little think about as that, it. we're already overdoing it. We've got Bronwyn on the line. Bronwyn <clears> from <throat> Sedgefield. Good morning. What is your question or comment for Dr. Morning. Darren Green? Uh, Dr. Darren Green, I'd just like to know, my husband's suffering with this illness and his stomach won't come down, even though he's on water tablets yeah. and potassium K such. Do you know any other remedies other than green juices that he's on to get swelling to come down? 
Oh, very good. Uh, so she mention, mentions a distended abdomen and swelling of the abdomen. Okay. And what happens is because the liver is damaged, I mentioned right at the start of the program, yeah. one of its crucial functions is to manufacture proteins. Yes. Mm. And the proteins are the molecules responsible of moving fluid across membranes in the body. Okay. So your water balance is affected because of the liver disease. And in his case, obviously, his albumin count will be quite low, and that's the ability to carry protein uh, water across membranes. And the water that builds up in the abdomen, it's a condition called ascites. Uh, and it's more towards when you've had a, quite a considerable amount of the liver damaged already. Mm. So the ability to move that, often you'll need therapeutic taps where they actually have to uh, drain the fluid from the abdomen itself mm. to, to make him more comfortable and to bring it down. But the actual uh, dietary components that she mentions are good. Yeah obviously less fatty, fatty foods to rest the liver cells, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously stopping all yeah. alcohol intake as well, yeah. uh, which is often difficult in chronic alcoholism. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, that's a very, very important component of it. Yeah. yeah. Wow, thank you all so right. much, Bronwyn. Hope yeah, that helped calling. a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, keep, we'll keep our lines open, 021430981, and continue our chat about liver health, liver disease being our next focus. And I also want to ask uh, Dr. Darren Green about this saying that African people have, when what you're very is? brave, yeah. or uh, they say, when it's been day, or you've got a liver, when I listen to it, where that might come from, it's <laughs> been bogging my mind during this conversation. <laughs> you know, we'll be back with that shortly. <laughs> it really has that. You've got it's my feel good breakfast show. <laughs> Welcome back to your Feel Good Breakfast Show. We've been theorizing about this uh, thing when people say, well, now let's say, you've got a liver. Uh, it probably means you've got what, a good, hard-working <laughs> organ. You're gutsy, you're, you're good gutsy. at it. It's a very important organ, I think, and it means that you've got a lot of stealth, a lot of gall, as you mentioned in the break. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Naffled, yeah. Naffled. Naffled, for those that cool. forget, yeah. So that, that involves fat infiltration of the liver, the, the deposition of cholesterol, triglycerides in the liver tissue itself, uh, but not as a result of alcohol. Yeah. That's because of our diets and the, what we eat. So this is another way in which we can damage yes. our livers so without realising it. That's why it's it. non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Yes. So you get uh, fatty liver from drinking alcohol, but you also can get it from other, from other causes. And mm -hmm. one of them obviously being our diets and which kind of fats we're ingesting, how, uh, what kind of lifestyle we're leading. Interesting enough, people always want to know, how do I get rid of the fat in between my normal liver cells? Yes. Once it's occurred, can I reverse the damage? Yes. And the answer is, sadly, there is no miracle cure to reverse and take away the fat. The only proven with like up to 1% reduction is exercise. Wow. Once it's occurred. Wow. So you won't necessarily have the symptoms of fatty uh, liver disease until... It's infiltrated, enlarged the liver, where it uh, obstructs blood flow, for example, or where it predisposes you to inflammatory processes and hepatitis. Wow. Then you'll get the symptoms of things like, like uh, nausea, jaundice, pain, etc. Yeah, so yeah. certainly here is where prevention is far better than the cure that's uh, yes. available out there. We've got a caller on the line, Great. Hamida, joining us from Cape Town. Good morning, Hamida. Morning, guys. I would like morning. to know why, don't, why, how, why can't they treat the jaundice? Why can you not treat jaundice? Is that the question? Yes. Okay, so, all right. Well, they can. Yes, oh, we can. You can. So there are different types of jaundice. Mm -hmm. uh, you get obstructive jaundice and non-obstructive jaundice. Mm -hmm. Obstructive jaundice means that some uh, pipes are being blocked. A simple example that can lead to that, for example, is like gallstones, where you have gall, uh, in your gallbladder, you have stones that form, blocks the, the common bile duct, for example, and you have black backflow of the, the bile and, obstruct and obstruction. Uh, and that's obstructive jaundice. You then also get in babies, uh, little jaundice, babies, yeah. jaundice. The nurse Neonatal actually... Neonatal jaundice, Yeah, the nurse example. actually told me to uh, take my son out into the sun because there's something Good about nurse. the... Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, I forgot her name. Thank you, nurse. But yes, talk about that. Yeah, so, so exposure to the sun obviously assists in the breakdown of the red cell, the red cells. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you have a, a build-up of, of that bilirubin, yes. you then have it depositing under the skin as a yellow tinge and a yellow color. That's why people that have uh, jaundice obviously can, can develop obviously yellow sclera. The white part of your eye becomes yellow and so does your skin. You get a funny golden haze about you. you look like I've seen people look like Mars 
Ma Martians. Really? A really bright yellow, like the couch you're sitting on almost. So wow. It's, okay. it's quite hectic. So that you need to review. And there are reversible causes, and then there are ones that aren't. Mm -hmm. So off for our caller, it would depend on what type. Neonatal yeah. jaundice, obstructive, mm -hmm. non-obstructive jaundice. And but that certainly picture. there are ways of treating it. Um, at what point do you get to what they call liver failure? Um, we, we've seen it or heard it in many of these mm. uh, medical series. Oh, there's liver failure, and that's usually at a very, very bad okay, point yeah. then. Well, firstly, liver failure is basically, uh, it's basically terminal. Uh, that you can't, unless you transplant the liver. Yes. Okay, so the failure is the compensatory mechanisms of the damaged, scarred liver over time, or even sometimes due to a short time, if it's cancers, for example, uh, cannot be reversed. So you've lost too much of the, the functions that we've mentioned, the mm. detox function. Uh, the nutritional function, so people lose weight dramatically. Mm -hmm. They can't remove the toxins, so they, they get confused due to the buildup of ammonia in the bloodstream because it can't be broken down and secreted in the urine. Yeah. They get encephalopathy, uh, you know, and with all that comes the loss of weight. The immune system is yeah. not regulated properly. You bleed, you can bleed spontaneously, and that leads to dire consequences. Now, I tell you what, we're going to keep you right there, Dr. Darren Green, for just one more segment when we come back because we're going to talk about how, in fact, you can improve your liver's health and the things that you can do, uh, not sure. just changing your, your dietary plan or maybe uh, consuming far less alcohol, but we'll keep our lines open as well. 0214309881. It's my feel good worth this show. All right, back again with Dr. Darren Green for our last little segment about liver health. I was asking uh, the good doctor just now how, how difficult it is to find a liver donor if you ever needed a transplant. That's really tough. And the amounts out there of organ donors uh, are certainly something that we try to um, educate the public about. You know, there are circumstances in which you can change someone's life and mm. become an organ donor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I certainly am one, um, and uh, you, you know it's really difficult. Obviously, the the course and the type of liver disease you have, and what other effects that's had on other systems of the body, would come into play. So they look at your full comorbidity picture. They also look at the etiology, the cause as to why you developed liver disease in the first place, yeah. uh, and your age, your prognosis, and they match all those factors. There's scoring systems for that, so I'm and sure obviously if it was a registry. Due to your own negligence. It Your chances are obviously less than I, I would I would assume to get uh, a, a yeah. liver above, for example, a newborn child yeah. with a tumor in the liver. Yeah. Just uh, as a as a as a suggestion. Sure. We've actually got a call on the line, Brian from Cape Town. Good morning. What is your question or comment for Dr. Darren Green? Yes. Good morning, team. Mm. Yeah, I'm a long distance runner, so there's always been this, um, you know, thing in, in in running about carbon loading and whether to carb load before three, four days before an ultra distance um, race, mm -hmm. or should one rather, uh, you know, take supplements during a race? And what what, what is the advantages or the disadvantages of um, on the liver about uh, doing the carb loading, and then um, should one rather use uh, supplements during a race to keep your um, glycogen levels um, high? That's a fantastic mm. question. Thank yes. you. That he, he spoke about doing a half marathon. Carboloading, yeah, because he, he, oh, he the does topic of carbo. Yes. yes, yes. So obviously, when you ingest carbohydrates, they, you have a portion of it that goes to the blood for immediate use yep. in the form of glucose. The rest goes to obviously the liver. It's then either stored in the liver through a certain cycle as glycogen, uh, which can be reversed when you need it later mm -hmm. on. In mm -hmm. this case, uh, or it can be sent to the muscles itself. Some of the glucose in excess can also be stored as fat. So people must remember that as well. So okay. rem remember that uh, with that process, there's a direct relationship as to which metabolic pathways you're using in breaking down, obviously, the nutrients uh, and so forth. So he's asking whether carbo loading versus intra-race, uh, yeah. hi uh, not hydration, but nutrition, yes. is actually... And you need to find what, what works for you in this case. It would also determine be determined by the type of event, the endurance event you're doing, you, your muscle mass, your clearance... Uh, in terms of your kidney function, etc., all that plays a role. So when you're looking at the amount of energy that you're burning and, and what you're consuming, if you're having these high-energy refined corn syrup gels during the... We find dire consequences for many of our athletes that, that wow. do use them. Wow, yeah. So you, you've got to be aware of how much is too much and whether you're hydrating sufficiently with them yeah. as to not to cause damage for an overload of certain systems in the liver, yeah. but also in the kidneys. 
Uh, and I think if you're really committed to the process, it's yeah. worth going to like the Sports Science Institute yes. uh, and uh, having a decent consult, especially if you're going to be doing quite a few half marathons, yeah. looking at your daily intakes and your amount of calories and so forth, and your food breakdown, yeah. and then tailor make it for yeah. your specific event. Yeah. So um, certainly there are advantages and exactly. benefits yeah. to you. Yeah. Quickly, before we have to end, considering everything that we've spoken about, how does one adequately look after your liver? I think firstly, do no harm. So yeah. don't willfully, if you know that your body can only handle two units, for example, uh, in a period of two hours, don't push the limits and pound your liver with 10 units of alcohol in an hour. Okay. I think your body's ability to deal with that and to break down alcohol and get rid of the, the byproducts is at an ability of one unit per hour. So yeah. mm. with that knowledge, you must take that and do something with it. Mm. Secondly, I think exercise helps in reducing the chances of fatty liver disease and our choices around mm. fatty foods, specifically saturated fats, the, yeah. uh, the, uh, lots of fried foods, yeah, etc. Yeah, yeah. We need to consider obviously uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease mm. and controlling obviously our long-term cholesterol, etc. Yeah. yeah, well, sure. I think we've uh, taken on board a lot of information today and we all want to have a healthy looking liver. I mean, we just do. looking at it, I'm, I'm getting so much appreciation it's for a healthy looking liver. I know, I was like that other one, not so much. I just much. want to protect Love the your liver. Love, yeah. Love yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a hug, if you will. <laughs> and thanks so much also to all of our callers for your questions. Dr. Thanks. Darren Green, appreciate it. We'll Thank see you again you. next thanks. week. Stick around with us.